line that I'm going to be showing you. So today is part one of a glorious look at Weird Tales Pulp Magazine. And uh, the, the reason, of course, is simple. This is the 100th anniversary, 100 years ago. In 1923, Weird Tales Pulp Magazine launched. And uh, it, in many ways, changed the dynamics, the fabric, the overall look of horror and dark fantasy and science fiction for that matter and mystery uh forever you know i mean everything kind of sprung from that magazine in my opinion that that was the thing so it the the importance of weird tales cannot be uh, overstated it was one of those things of course it came before amazing stories and astounding and all of those science fiction pulps People considered it a, you know, kind of a cult ghost story type of magazine. But in reality, it was horror. It was dark fantasy. It was mystery, thriller, and a bit of science fiction, you know. And, of course, H.P. Lovecraft supplied a lot of that science fiction in what I would call science fiction horror. That was the big thing with Lovecraft. It was more far more than supernatural. Lovecraft did very little supernatural stuff. Most of his stuff dealt with science fiction in a with a hor great horror background, of course. Shadowhawk Talks is on the scene. Hello, Shadowhawk. How you doing? Good to see you, man. Uh, so, yeah. That is the, the, you know, the, this is the glory of Weird Tales. So to get an understanding, as I was saying on Friday night, to get a better understanding, I think, of, as to what was going on 100 years ago in the United States, what the hell was up? You know, what, what were the political, cultural, social things that were happening in the 20s? And most people you know, would recognize the phrase, the Roaring Twenties, of which it was. And of course, it came to a horrific crash in 1929 with the stock market crash and so forth. But uh, for the majority of the 1920s, it was roaring. Oh, so many things were going on. It was an incredible period of time. And uh, so we're going to first take a look at that. Then we're going to get into some weird tales. Paulo is on the scene. Howdy, Paulo. How are you doing? Shadowhawk says Apex Comics Fembat coming soon. Fantastic. Welcome back to the weird hat. <laughs> okay. All right. So here we go, guys. Now, once the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look and see what was going on in 1923. What was up? You know, uh, that that's something that what was going on. There we go. I want to get rid of that. Um, so we're going to take a look first at uh, some, some of the basics. OK, that's that's what we really want to take a look at. So. The first thing we're going to take a look at is who, who was president? Anybody? Well, it's too late. You can't guess because it was Warren G. Harding. And uh, there were some really interesting things about Warren G. Harding. He became president in 2021 officially, of course. And, uh, well, he died in office. Yes, in 2023. Here we go. I'm just going to give a little bit. I don't want to bore anybody, but. I'm going to make sure this is showing on the screen. I'm going to do this to enlarge the screen. But 29th U.S. President Warren Harding served in office from 1921 to 1923 before dying of an apparent heart attack. Okay. Harding's presidency was overshadowed by the criminal activities of some of his cabinet members and other government officials. Although he himself was not involved in any wrongdoing, allegedly. Okay, now we don't know. You know it's hard to say, but 
Of course, scandals came out after his death, such as the Teapot Dome scandal and other instances of corruption that came to light, which did damage his reputation after death. Um, so uh, that is a very an interesting thing, because, of course, it is not often that a president dies in office. There's just a few cases of it. So first, first off, just to put things into perspective, Warren Harding dies in office in 1923 of an apparent heart attack. There is considerable scandal revolving around his presidency, people in his cabinet, you know, even though apparently he wasn't directly involved. So that is the first, what I would consider to be very interesting bit of news from 1923, but we're going to get into it much more heavily here. Now, this is a great page. It's on this day. So it's 1923, historical events in 1923. Now, we're just going to go with the highlights here, okay? There we go. January 13th, 1923, taking advantage of the chaotic condition of Germany, Hitler stages a demonstration of 5,000 stormtroopers and denounces the November crime. There you go. Hitler is already like making major waves in 1923. He is the dictator of Nazi Germany, as they say. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these highlights because they're, you know, it, it's, I don't want to bore the shit out of you, but some of these are very interesting. Historic event February 1st, fascist voluntary militia forms in Italy under Benito Mussolini. Another swell guy that uh, we would be hearing from later on. Uh, but there's old Italian dictator, Benito Mussolini, and of course... That ties into uh, the Italian anarchists and uh, and anarchists in general that plagued uh, various parts of the world in the 1920s. Certainly, uh, so that's going to that's going to come into play. Music history: Noel Coward, uh, the Young Idea, premieres at the Savoy Theater in London. This is particularly interesting. It kind of ties into Houdini and Weird Tales magazine. Tutankhamun's burial chamber found. Uh, explorer archaeologist Howard Carter opens the inner burial chamber of Egyptian pharaoh Tutankhamun's tomb and finds the sarcophagus. Now, that is a bit of really amazing history right there. This is February 16th, 1923, folks. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, oh, yeah, here we go. An another political figure. March 4th, Vladimir Len Lenin's last article in Pravda, uh, which is apparently ab about Soviet bureaucracy, appears and, of course, he's the Marxist revolutionary and Soviet leader, Vladimir Lenin. So he's, he's on. Now, this is kind of shortly before his death. And, uh, oh, you got, uh, yeah, now, Garlis, yes, he's, he, he was a famous Argentinian singer. And I, I am familiar with the name, Carlos Gardel. But in any case, they make the note here that on March 7th, he applies for Argentine citizenship, which is rather interesting. Um, yeah, March 14th, U.S. President Warren G. Harding becomes first president to pay taxes. That's kind of a bizarre footnote there in the 1923 history uh historic event here we go april 5th firestone tire and rubber company starts producing inflatable tires there you go folks april 5th 1923 harvey firestone yeah 
there's some cricket history in there, but there are some other things which I found rather interesting. There we go. June 6th, Edgar Wallace becomes the first British radio sports journalist reporting on the Derby for the British Broadcasting Company, of course, the BBC. Edgar Wallace. Uh, yeah, this guy was kind of a weird freak. June 6th, gangster Albert Anastasia is convicted of illegal possession of a firearm and sentenced to two years in prison. Plenty of, plenty of criminals roaming around, you know, all parts of the, uh, the world, including the United States. They're really, they're doing it to it at this time. Um, historic event, June 9th, Bulgarian premier uh, Stambolensky and King Boris III are overthrown. Interesting. Here we go. June 12th, Harry Houdini. Weird tales, big tie-in. Uh, Harry Houdini frees himself from a straitjacket while suspended upside down 40 feet above ground in New York City. Good old Harry, Harry Houdini. Now he's just so, he's mega popular at this time, obviously in the 1920s. The guy is just all over the place. Uh, and he finds himself in Weird Tales, we're going to get to the story behind how his stories, quote unquote, in Weird Tales came to be. And it's an interesting little tale and a somewhat weird tale, my friends. So here we go. Let's, let's take a look. Uh, yeah. June 21st, Marcus Garvey sent us to five years for using mail to defraud. Interesting. Um, yeah, this is a bizarre one. The first aerial refueling. Now, I would never have thought in a million years that, I mean, I was, you know, you think aerial refueling, God, they may have tried it in the 1950s or 60s for the first time. No. June 27th, 1923, Captain Lowell Smith and Lieutenant John Richter performed the first ever aerial refueling uh, in a DH-4B biplane. That is stunning. I mean, you know, it hadn't been, uh, you know, so long. I mean, flight was still, obviously, you know, you've got uh, your, you know, biplanes still going, and they're, they're already refueling in the air. Uh, it's just absolutely incredible, man. You know, so that that's definitely worthy of, of uh, news. Here we go. By in sports, boxing, boxing title fight. Jack Dempsey beats Tommy Gibbons on points over 15 hard fought rounds in Shelby, Montana, to retain his world heavyweight boxing title. Jack Dempsey, he's one of the biggest, well, absolutely one of the biggest names in boxing to this day, you know. And no doubt about it. Here's another interesting tidbit. Hollywoodland. The Hollywood sign is officially dedicated in the hills above Hollywood, Los Angeles. It originally reads Hollywoodland, but the last four letters are dropped after renovation in 1949. So there you go. This is, you know, once again in 1923, up goes the Hollywoodland sign. Historic event, Albert Einstein speaks on pacifism in Berlin. Oh, good old Einstein. Been there. Um, August 3rd, here we go. August 3rd, Vice President Calvin Coolidge becomes 30th, U 30th U.S. President upon the death of President Warren G. Harding, who died of an apparent heart attack. Okay. Let's just let's just put that in quotes. I think that would be uh, quite appropriate. I don't know, but how? Yeah, she's kind of an interesting looking gal. 
<laughs> I don't know what to say. U.S. Open women's tennis. Helen Willis Moody beats uh, Mola Birchstedt Mallory uh, for her first of seven U.S. singles crowns. So there you go. Women kicking butt in tennis, apparently. Um, Pavo Nermi, uh, Finnish runner, gets the uh, 410 mile in uh, Stockholm. Record stands until 1931. He is nicknamed the Flying Finn. <laughs> I love it. Uh, this is so great. This is great. And there you go. That that's their that's their uh, the kind of the prime. Oh wait a second! No no. I missed the second page. Yeah, we're not. Yeah, we we've mentioned Mussolini. Yeah. No, oh, there we go. Coup d'état. Uh, Miguel Primo de Rivera leads a military coup with the support of King Alfonso VIII to become Prime Minister of Spain. A lot of coups and anarchy and shit going on. Uh, you know, and of course, the, the uh, various fascist leaders. Things are, you know, just four years after World War II. World War II officially ends November of 1918. So Weird Tales launches about four years later you know in march of 1923 and so what we're looking at here is stuff that's gone on or about four years going on about four years after the great world war world war one uh so it's interesting to see the pol especially the political uh turmoil that is happening and there's a ton of it there's just shit going on all over the place um in, in Europe, you know, and elsewhere, obviously. Eastern Europe as well. Uh, here we go. This is a great one. Baseball record. Not, uh, September 27th, 1923, New York Yankee Lou Gehrig hits the first of what would be his 493 home runs of all time. So there you go, Lou Gehrig, one of the greats. You know, there's no doubt about that. Here we go. Historic event, October 5th. We're almost uh, done with the uh, highlights on the historic events for 1923, folks. Sorry if this, I mean, I, I find this stuff fascinating and it does kind of put things into context. Uh, Edwin Hubble, you know, the Hubble telescope? It's Edwin Hubble here. He identifies the, the Cepheid variable star. Okay, uh, there you go. In October, uh, October 5th of 2023, Edwin Hubble making the major news right there. Here we go with another major one, baseball record. October 11th, a pair of Babe Ruth home runs in the fourth and fifth innings is the difference. New York Yankees beat the New York Giants 4-2 to two at the Polo Grounds to tie the World Series 1-1. Babe Ruth on the scene. Good God, man. Yeah, here we go. And this, uh, you know, some it's it's just a weird the teapot dome scandal comes up several times. But October 25th, the Senate committee publishes first report on the teapot dome scandal. And, you know, obviously members of Harding's cabinet were involved with this. Who knows how m much further it went? You know, I mean, Harding was never directly uh, connected to the scandal who knows but you know that parent heart attack is interesting to say the least considering all the other stuff that's going around on in the world and in politics in the united states as well coup d'etat uh, november 8th adolf hitler and the nazi party stage beer hall putsch in Munich, Germany. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Hey, there you go. Good God. Um, here we go. November 22nd. Calvin Coolidge pardons World War I German spy Lothar Witzke, who was sentenced to death. Interesting. Film and history. 
Here we go. And this is going to come up again, November 23rd. Cecil B. DeMille's first version of the Ten Commandments premieres in the USA. And that's it. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to 1923 in film. I'm just going to put this up here. And I know I've got a few more comments, so I'm going to go back up. <laughs> Darth Vader's stormtroopers. Okay. Uh, that Lennon guy wrote great songs with that McCartney guy. Oh, my God. Oh, uh, you're such a... You know, you said, Lorenzo, you're such a card. You really should be dealt with. Uh, in any case, Michael Dodd, thanks for all the future flat tires. Harvey, well, you know, it's that Firestone magic. Uh, if you want to put it that way, good God. Harry Houdini, it's Harry Houdini inspiring generations of crazy people from <laughs> David Copperfield to Johnny Knoxville. Yeah. Oh my God, man. Hey, Meyer's on the scene. Hello, Meyer. How's it going? Good to see you. Apex, hooray for Hollywood land. Yeah. Did you guys, just as an aside, there's a movie, I think it's, it was called Hollywood land with Ben Affleck and, and it was about George Reeves, you know, who played Superman in the TV show and Affleck, plays George. It's really a good movie. And I think it was just called Hollywood Land, if I'm not mistaken. But it's worth seeing, folks, if you get a chance. Apex Scott says Jack Dempsey. Yeah. He's one of those eternal names, you know. John Sol John O'Sullivan box Captain America in Marvel Treasury Edition by Centennial Tales. Oh yeah, they they did a lot of good mashups in there. Coup de twat is better. Okay, Michael Dodd. He's getting a little spicy on the scene. Good Lord. Paul Acosta says, auto racing in, 20, in 1923. First edition of the Le Mans 24 Hours Endurance Race. Celebra celebrating its centenary this year. They, there's another... 100th anniversary, Mark. Thanks for that info, Paulo. They uh, definitely did not mention that uh, in the in the list there. Or if they did, uh, it wasn't highlighted. Uh, and it should have been. I mean, that's the first edition of the Le Mans. For Christ's sake. That is, that is a great bit of info. Thank you, Paulo. Also, Paulo says... Uh, the 1923 Indianapolis 500 crowned its first multiple winner, Tommy Milton. Wow, so racing history in 1923. Jesus, you got planes, you know, fucking biplanes flying around refueling in midair. And you got, uh, you know, the I, which I didn't even realize the Indianapolis 500 and the uh, Le Mans were even going uh, in, in the early 20s. I mean, they didn't waste any time with, uh, you know, souping up those hot rods. I swear to God, man, you know, getting uh, racing vehicles going. That's amazing. Apex, happy 100 Weird Tales. Who owns the IP? Uh, I. That's a very good question, uh, Apex there. You know, you might look into it. I do know this, the first... I don't know, you know, many, many issues of Weird Tales are public domain. So, they, you know, people are just reprinting the hell out of them at their leisure. People do pick up the title. And to this day, some guy, unfortunately, he's like a woke tard freak, uh, has is currently uh, publishing Weird Tales. I look. Weird Tales went from 1923 to 1954. For me, that was Weird Tales. It has been resurrected, for instance, in the 80s and 90s. I think even in the early 2000s. Now some other schmo is doing it. 
I have no interest, really. I, my interest is in the original Weird Tales. So there you go. IP Schmipe is, I guess, what I'm saying with that on on the Weird Tales thing. I, I, I you know, it just seems like people, whatever, they, they uh, decide, hey, I'm going to, you know, uh, republish Weird Tales. There was also a Weird Tales comic book. Apex. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with it. It was Millennium Comics Group that published, I, I believe it was either late 80s, early 90s, but they came out with at least one issue of Weird Tales. And it had the Weird Tales logo and everything in it, you know? It's kind of interesting. Michael Taylor, yeah, Houdini would hang from buildings and do all kinds of other tricks, and people would stand on the streets to watch him. Yeah. He was doing that shit all the time, you know. Lorenzo Sleestack, I've always been a bit confused about the Marcus Garvey mail fraud case. Yeah, I, I don't know. You know, that that's that's something for another lifetime. Um, Michael Taylor, hello, Apex. Are you doing a stream anytime soon? Maybe tonight or tomorrow, Michael Taylor. There you go, folks. You've heard it here first. Apex may be on the scene live. Uh, tonight or tomorrow. Lorenzo Sleestack, Wikipedia needs to be to highlight more events in lizard history. Uh, oh my God. If Weird Tales is public domain, then I will resurrect it CG style and do an anthology of horror in a few years. Yeah, that's the whole thing. Now, I can tell you this. Some of it's not in public domain. You can't just, you know, reprint any issues. For instance, in I, I know for a fact in the 1940s and 50s, a lot of that stuff is copywritten. However, in the 1920s and at least part of the 30s, it's public domain. So people are literally reprinting them and selling them. There's a... Uh, a website called lulu.com you can go there there are a couple of sellers and they're selling stuff i'm going to 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 bring these out but for instance this is a reprint let me kill this there we go this is a reprint that uh i got from lulu.com and it, they're pretty de decent i mean it look it's just a straight ahead it's nothing fancy. It, of course, it was all black and white on the inside. But you, as you can see, it's quite decent. And these run around $10, you know, uh, per reprint. I mean, hey, look, you, you're either going to pay $10 or you can get the original for 1000 if you can find it. So, you know, that that's, <laughs> that's your choice right there. But this is public domain. Weird Tales. What is this? 19... 1930, for example, this is public domain material. You know. So there you go. Weird tales will be new and original. Yeah, they always do it. Well, it's 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 going right now, Apex. Unfortunately, it's I don't know. It's just it's just woke garbage. You know they they what what they do it's it's a big grift really what they they hate people like a H.P. Lovecraft and they'll denounce him like as a sexist and racist and all this other crap, but then they'll turn around and they'll they'll make money on his name. These grifters are a dime a dozen. They do this. The the current idiots that are running weird tales do the same shit. In my opinion, in my humble opinion. Uh, the reprint is the next best thing. Yeah, for us that, you know, people that aren't millionaires, yes. Uh, reprints are the only way to go, man. Because uh, you, the, the original, especially the 1920s and 1930s issues of Weird Tales uh, are just through the roof. I mean, they're, they're so extreme. Weird Tales is extremely hot. It is like, you know, it's one of those things where you will pay hundreds and then into thousands of dollars for an original copy in any collectible shape, you know. Lorenzo says, if you reprint the wrong issue, the cryptkeeper will send a cease and desist letter or possibly sue you. 
He's a lawyer now. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Maybe maybe the ghost of Houdini will come and hang you upside down from a, you know, building in New York City. I, that would that might be a you know, or maybe he'll he'll put you in a a tomb in in an Egyptian pyramid. I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me. You know, Meyer says. They hate him because of what he named his cat, but they still want those Cthulhu bucks. Yeah, that's basically it. But the great thing about Lovecraft is that in it, it, what really kills them, the all of these people that are just, you know, losing their shit over Lovecraft and other writers, they thought Robert E. Howard was just a, you know, once again, a misogynist and a racist and all. They call him all kinds of names. They can't cancel him. They're beyond cancellation, and it drives those woke tards nuts. They cannot cancel these people. They've already, it's already happened. It is happening. Lovecraft, Robert E. Howard, all of these writers of, of any big note, Ray Bradbury, of course, Robert Block, they continue to get reprinted. They continue to sell. Their names are big. You know, they're, they are indeed, if they weren't successful while living they're certainly just huge names now in the in the genres of science fiction horror fantasy and so forth they're gigantic and they're unstoppable so that really gnaws at these little woke tards um michael dodd says millennium published a weird tales one shot in 1992 as i just mentioned yes it had a deluxe version as well bolton cover Kelly Jones, Tim Vigil. I think it was just, yeah, it was just a, a a one one shot. I don't know why they didn't do a series. That's kind of weird. Apex, no reprints in my weird tales. Maybe a public domain reprint from 1943, but mostly new weird and horror stories. Never woke, never woke, folks. Never woke. That's the key right there. Fireball Comics on the scene. Hello, Fireball. Woke tards treat people worse than some of those they complain about. Yeah, they do. That's just, you know. Oh, we're going to get into it. You know, it's funny. You're going to see next Friday night, folks. I am doing a special uh, Friday night episode. Now, on Friday nights, we always, you know, look at films on Tubi and Canopy and other platforms. Uh, And uh, so it's that's going to be it's going to be the same, but it's all going to be weird tales related and if you want to see some grifting going on with some of these idiots that that use lovecraft's name to make a buck you gotta see friday night show this is it's gonna be a hoot we are going to have a blast with these fuckers pardon my french or don't um meyer says they always they also hate doctors they they yeah they dr seuss you know, uh, yeah, because he was right about them. Yeah, that's exactly it. You know, good God, mine too, Apex. Okay. Oh uh, yeah, it, a thing to to say, Apex. You know about the reprints. Now, one thing to keep in mind with the original Weird Tales, something that was awesome about Weird Tales right off the bat is that they, of course, reprinted stories from writers such as Edgar Allan Poe, Bram Stoker, a ton of people. They kept, H.G. Wells was reprinted in Weird Tales. So it was, you know, that was something, you know, the guy I'm getting into now, I'm going to get into the kind of an introduction, a little bit of a, a, a brief history of Weird Tales, how it came to be, who was behind it, and so forth. But very important because the people that were behind Weird Tales loved horror, dark fantasy, the macabre, ghost stories, weird stories, whatever. They really, it wasn't just like, ah, I'm going to do me, I'm going to do me a magazine and make some money. No, they, they actually loved the subject matter. So that made a difference. Okay. And uh, we are going to check that out right now. But one other thing before we get into it, I just want to. Uh, bring this back for a second just to give you guys an idea 
as to what was going on in cinema in the 1920s. This is, you know, the, the, the being, a, you know, this channel being somewhat film oriented, I think this is kind of important. So here we go. We'd seen the uh, news on the Ten Commandments, Cecil B. DeMille. Now, these are the highest grossing films of 1923. Okay. And uh, so you have the Ten Commandments on top grossing over four million dollars now four million dollars in 1923 is the equivalent equivalent of like i don't know 10 trillion dollars today no i'm kidding but it is it's uh you can multiply that i believe i saw the figure one dollar in 1923 with inflation equivalent is about 17 dollars so just multiply that by 17 dollars that's a hell of a return. I mean, that's, I mean, like if, you know, uh, so in any case, that's uh, rank number one. Number two is the covered wagon. Number three is Harold Lloyd's safety at last. Uh, the great Harold Lloyd. Now, you guys know physical comedy in the 1920s is just shredding. You got Harold Lloyd. You got Charlie Chaplin. You have Buster Keaton. These guys are just, you know, they're insane. I mean, they're kind of like, you know, uh, they're taking chances like uh, Harry Houdini. I mean, seriously, man, a lot of these guys kind of risk their lives uh, to do comedy stunts. The physical comedy in the 20s is just, you know, and it's fantastic. You can, you can go back and watch these films and it's amazing. That's why some of those films are, to, to this day, some of the greatest comedies, along with, of course, you know, getting into the late 20s and, and into the 30s with the fantastic, the never paralleled Marx Brothers, uh, and who also did insane stuff. But really, Harold Lloyd, Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, probably a few others at that time. Uh, we're just doing insane stuff. Let's get back. Oh, Paula says, you always do the Friday show while I'm doing the Cavern of Chaos. Ah, I see, I see. Uh, yeah, it, you know, and there's so many shows. There are like a billion shows that are going on Friday night, from like between 6 p.m. and midnight. There's just so many, but it's just, it's the Friday night thing to do. And I just figured, what the hell? I know I'm going up against a ton of great shit. And, uh, you know, but it's just, it's a really great night to do uh, shows, you know. Michael Dodd says, hard to believe that there has been no long running, running Weird Tales comic book series. The name recognition is still very powerful. You've got it. And, you know, and obviously Apex is, you know, uh, right on it there. Uh, when I started talking about that, I, I still can't believe that Millennium only did one. That just, you know, I mean, maybe it just wasn't the timing wasn't good, you know, back when they published the first issue but it just seems to me like it's a natural or there's one of two things okay uh weird tales illustrated maybe is something that people just aren't into maybe they rather read them and then you know you where you get you know an issue of weird tales and it has you know illustrations a lot like you get like at least a dozen 20 maybe 20 illustrations in a you know single issue so maybe people would just you know they they were like more into reading uh and less into seeing graphic interpretations of weird tale stories i one of the it's one of the two i don't know you know um yeah it's it's a mystery 
Paulo says, it's always the same thing with anthologies, Michael. Even among specialized audiences such as ourselves, they're hard to sell. Yeah, yeah I get, you know, it's one of those deals, man, with graphic graphic anthologies. Um, Apex says, Harold Lloyd loved to climb tall buildings. That guy was nuts, man. He was, and he was fantastic. I've got, folks, I have got uh harold lloyd haunted spooks which is one of his great god it's such a great movie now of course when you say movies back in the day back in the early 20s uh well into you know, in, in the 20s in the 1920s the silent films when when somebody said yeah it's a feature it was like 20 or 30 minutes maybe 40 minutes long that was a feature film okay so I have on Super 8 uh, Harold Lloyd's Haunted Spooks, and it's like 20 minutes long. And that was a feature that came out wildly popular. Uh, and it's great. I, I suggest, you know, it, I'm sure it's on YouTube. I highly recommend it. It's just a, just a great Harold Lloyd at the top of his game. He is so good, you know. And these guys, it was. They were, of course, it was the silent era. So the comedians had to do this physical slapstick that was just way beyond the, you know, the, the, what we would expect, you know, what we grew up with maybe in the 60s, 70s and 80s, where people didn't, you know, you had sound, it was, you know, sound had, had come in. And so they didn't have to try as hard. I think they were just like trying to make up for the fact that it was silent film. So they had to put this stuff across in such a, a wildly physical manner. And so when you watch Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton and Harold Lloyd, man, they're just going for it. It's, it's insane stuff. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of amazed and I don't know this. But I didn't, I never heard of anybody getting seriously in injured doing comedies. Now, in the Westerns, the Tom Mix stuff and so forth, yes, there would be injuries, you know, you get the horseback riding and all that stuff and stunts with the stunts. But I never heard of any serious injuries. I may be wrong. Maybe somebody knows uh, with one of the big comedy stars, you know, like Lloyd or Keaton. Um, where they were, they were, you know, kind of gravely injured and they were out for many months. Michael Taylor says it would be crazy money today. Yeah. I mean, you gotta have to keep in mind, of course, the budget, I don't know what the budget to the big, the 10 commandments was. I'm sure it was, it was probably over a million dollars once again, which was huge just a massive budget for 1923 so it did it was while you know it was it was definitely very popular it made over four million that year but check it out i mean near and dear to our hearts i come to number four the fourth largest grossing film of 1923 the hunchback of notre dame universal pictures grossed over a million dollars starring lon cheney as you guys know there it is. I just wanted to get to that because uh, that's quite a key for for you know for our for our folk. <laughs> I mean, Lon Chaney is just absolutely fantastic. I love that film. Now, I am uh, I'm kind of I'm partial to uh, to uh, Charles Lawton. Charles Lawton's performance as uh, Quasimodo in The Hunchback of Notre Dame uh, in the 30s. And he he was just, you know, it's just an acting tour de force. But, of course, he had the advantage of being able to talk. Uh, you know, Lon Chaney had to do everything physically in 1923. It was silent. He had to come across emotionally with his actions, with his face, you know, and the the makeup. As I understand it, you know, the hump on his back was something like over 50 pounds. It weighed over 50 pounds. You watch that guy, Lon Chaney, swinging off those fucking, the, uh, the uh, 
facades that they built, you know, for the film. Unbelievable uh, athleticism uh, and daring that, you know, once again, he's another one of those guys. I think I would put him similarly in with uh, uh, Harold Lloyd and Buster Keaton and, and Charlie Chaplin for his physical heroics on screen. I mean, that dude... Lon Chaney was was one of he was fearless. He was fearless like those guys. And on top of that, he was arguably the greatest makeup artist that ever lived. And the reason why I say that, and we talked about this Friday night, is that he was going off of nothing. He was the guy making it up. You know, Dick Smith and uh, Jack Pierce and Rob Bottin and uh, all of these guys, uh, Rick Baker. They all had people they looked to, you know, in the past. I mean, Jack Pierce was certainly uh, completely uh, influenced by Lon Chaney. Dick Smith was influenced by Jack Pierce and Lon Chaney. And Rob, Rob Bottin and Rick Baker were influenced by all of those guys. So they had things to go by. They had books to look at. They had movies to look at. They could see, figure out techniques that they were doing in the past and improve on them but of course Lon Chaney was making that stuff up as he went along and when you look at the Hunchback of Notre Dame and of course uh, films like Phantom of the Opera those makeups are still just amazing uh, they hold up there is there is no cheapness or unrealistic quality in my opinion about Lon Chaney's makeups and, and Meyer brought up uh, the clown the film uh shit i forget i don't know i keep forgetting these or the one where he's uh, the legless guy and then he, of course he plays uh, ah, just a variety of of roles they all look great cheney always looked freak I, I think you guys would agree there is not one crap looking makeup that ever came out of the Lon Chaney uh, makeup box. Let's put it that way. Michael Dodd says, uh, Warren Publishing did okay with the anthology format back in the day, Paulo. It was marketable. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. They, you know, that was, yeah, that was something else, though. It's an interesting way. The way that they did it, the way that Warren did it, I think was his for his his. Uh, uh, how would you say his formula for success in with those magazines was something that people, you know, we we talked about this before. It was 1964, eerie and creep. Well, creepy. Warren Publishing comes onto the scene. And uh, this was just, you know, several years after the Comics Code Authority. So it was like, yeah, we need to make a large format magazine that bypasses the Comics Code Authority. And, you know, we are going to do creepy and then eerie. And I think that was something that people were just like, God, man, you know, comics sucked now. We Horror comics. Let, let, me, let, let me get specific. Horror and crime comics just started sucking. In my humble opinion, after 1955, I mean, yet they couldn't do anything. So Warren was like, "Yeah, we need to bring back the grizzly, you know, the the, the quote unquote gore, the grizzle, and all that stuff." And uh, I think that's why it was such a big success for such a long time. People were at that point they were hungry for it, you know, and that that's why Myron Foss was so successful with reprinting those you know stories in a large he was even more blatant about giving the comics code authority the the middle finger because he was like yeah i'm going to take those same stories that you banned and i'm going to put them into a magazine format and you can't touch me nah, 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 nah. And that's what he did that's exactly what foss did just a brazen move i love it i love it you know Ah, God, Michael Taylor. I don't know if there was a real scene, but Lloyd would hang from a clock. Well, he did hang from a clock. It was forced perspective in a 
in a certain way. It looked like he was hanging literally like, you know, I don't know, 50 or 100 feet up, you know, from a building. But he wasn't. He he was he was, I don't know, 10 feet or something uh, from the the rooftop. But it was it was just angled in such a way where in reality he was, he you know, he just would have fallen, you know, and no, no real injury uh it for that sequence yeah because look if he had really uh, done that and he was hanging from a clock 50 or 100 feet in the air i don't even i mean that's just like a suicide wish or something i don't know a uh, death wish the timing of weird tales is perfect well you know that's uh it could be uh the time well it's it's I don't, you know, the time it's always perfect. It's always been perfect, Apex, because Weird Tales has always been and it always will be. But I consider that 1923 to 1954. <laughs> I'm just a stickler for that. Crowdfund and hire a few illustrators and another writer for Weird Tales, perhaps. Yeah, they're doing well right now. You know, that's that's the thing. The Weird Tales reiterations uh, since at least the 90s. Haven't been very successful, Apex. You may want to look into that. Uh, I don't think the current one's going to last, and it shouldn't, because I think the guy's a douche anyways. But uh, in any case, it's just, look, people look at weird tales, and they inevitably, they look back to... 1923 to 1954 <laughs> that's it and they love it and we can't get enough of it we and that's a lot of man that's 31 years of a great pulp magazine you know and it only went out because pulps weren't going out in the 50s that was it man they were like yeah let's hang it up there's no more pulp action uh time to move on and and so they ended weird tales but man you got 31 years of it in my opinion, okay, 31 years of joy. For me, it was 1923 to like the early 1940s. Let's say 1943, that first 20 years, that was total magic. But they still had great stuff. Bradbury was getting published, Robert Block, you know, all kind. Matheson was in there, man. They, you know, just a ton. Of, uh, Virgil Finlay was still doing covers. I'm going to show you some of that stuff real quick here but uh it's tricky it's tricky it's timing it's a lot of different things you know uh, michael taylor says yeah those guys obviously had no fear yeah they were they were uh you know it was a different era folks people were willing to take physical risks that we many most of us are not today you know there were just a lot more hardcore uh, people, I don't know, actors, you know, doing in film that were willing to do it themselves as opposed to having stuntmen do it for them. And that That's really the, the reality of it. Meyer says, I feel that black exploitation guys missed out on the hunch black of Notre Dame. They could have done it. Of course, they did count Funkenstein, you know, uh, that that's you know one of those things but yeah you're right they did of course blackula they could have named him quasi brodo happy black history month everyone <laughs> quasi brodo ouch i think they're how about quasi mofo would that be better i don't know in any case let's see here charles lawton married the bride of frankenstein Yes, you're absolutely right, Elsa Lanchester. Uh, Charles Lott, that lucky bastard is all I got to say. But of course, it was Charles Lawton. You know, uh, I think we can. And what a great, that's, a, that's just a classically great Hollywood marriage, isn't it? Charles Lawton and Elsa Lanchester. Good God. I mean, I, it's, it's, I mean, can you imagine being at that wedding? Jesus Christ, man. I mean, that would be like, that's the kind of Hollywood time, even though there were scandals and shit, like Hollywood has always had scandals, but man, that was a great time 
uh, for Hollywood. And like w- when you were like proud, like you would go, yeah, Hollywood is freaking awesome. And the people in it are totally great <laughs> as opposed to now, where it's just like, I want to stay as far away from Hollywood as I possibly can. Talk about a flip in the switch, man. Uh, it's amazing that Hunchback of Notre Dame was fourth on the list. Yeah. But it just goes to show it was a big spectacle and they did spend, it was a big budget film. You know, there's no doubt about that. It's a fantastic film. I implore everybody watching. If you have not seen the 1923 Hunchback of Notre Dame with Lon Chaney, you got to see it. I'm sure that it's everywhere. It's got to be on all, it's got to be on YouTube. Yeah. And not first on the list. And not first. What? But yeah, but you're talking about Cecil B. B. DeMille. Uh, He's, I mean, this guy was an absolute giant at the time, you know, with uh, the Ten Commandments. There's no way that, there's no way anything's going to beat that. There's no way. Lon Chaney, Man of a Thousand Faces, Apex. Uh, And James Cagney, starring in the man of a thousand faces as we talked about Friday night. And he was great. I think, uh, let me, God, it might may be giving you bad sound. Sorry about that. But as we were talking about Friday night, uh, James Cagney, who of course is just, I don't know. He's universally known as a bad guy, gangster. All of his big films were gangster films. He starred as Lon Chaney in The Man of a Thousand Faces, and I thought he was awesome. That is, if you if you haven't seen that film, check it out. It's really quite good, and it just showed that Cagney could, you know, he was kind of typecast. It was an unfortunate thing with Cagney uh, because he just got typecast into that, you know, mean gangster type of thing, and uh, he was so good in in Man of a Thousand Faces. I I really recommend that film. Uh, Michael Dodd says, I watched Lawton as the hunchback last night. Good version. Lawton is still best in Island of Lost Souls, though. Yeah, man, Lawton was just kicking butt in the early 30s. You know, there was also, I want to say, the old dark house, right? And that was kind of a drama, comedy drama. Well, how would you say it? There's horror, there's comedy, and there's drama in the old dark house. It's really an interesting film. Of course, Boris Karloff is in that, but Charles Lawton, uh, and he's, he's very good in the comedic, you know, doing some comedic delivery. I love it, you know, but, uh, yeah, Island of Lost Souls. He is just, whew, man, what a, just, well, one of my favorite films, no doubt about it, man. It it's in my top 10 of all time. No doubt. But The Hunchback is, it's, it's pretty hardcore. He's, he's just so great in it. Weird Tales, EC comic, comics elements and CG style quality and marketing. Yeah. You know, that's something, I think that's a a discussion maybe for another night apex. And it's a good discussion too, because, you know, I've, and you might agree, you may not, but the more I've looked into to CG, and it's not just CG, it's just modern comics in general, the more it looks the same. I just got a an issue of Heavy Metal magazine from 2019. It's just like 90% computerized. It looks like somebody drew it on a computer, they colored it on a computer, they lettered it on a computer, and I don't like it. I just, it doesn't do any, I look at it. It could be really a good story too. And the shit just doesn't do it for me. You know, I know apex that you do your stuff by hand, uh, you know, and you color it by hand and it's real on the page, you know, by hand. I appreciate that much more. Uh, I just can't get it. You know, I don't care what the hell it is. Uh, but man, if you were going to do weird tales, a computer could not touch that. The only thing a computer could do would be to scan the hand-drawn and colored pages uh, to for printing. That would be it because you touch a computer with weird tales, 
the two do not mix in any way, no how, no shape, no form. Uh, it's just, yeah, I, 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 in my opinion, in my opinion, I don't think computerization and weird tales uh, are, are good partners. Uh, Michael Taylor, as far as art goes, you know, drawing. Michael Taylor says, yeah, I figured that scene couldn't be real. Yeah, it's a great. Oh, there were several. Like, they used forced perspective, of course, in the 20s. Because they didn't have, like, uh, really advanced optical effects, even though uh, Metropolis and a few other films, they would get into some really amazing optical effects that I still think have not been duplicated to this day. But um, the, 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 the way that they did it with the comedies, it, when they had like certain outrageous scenes, uh, they would use forced perspective. So, you know, it would, you'd have the city scene in the background. It looks like he's hanging off a building, you know, 50 feet or 100 feet in the air. But he's actually, you know, you, the, he's hanging off the roof He's hanging off a building, but the roof below him is like, you know, five or ten feet below him. So if he falls, he's just falling five feet. No biggie. Um, and that's how they would do it. It would they would just make it look like that, you know, there's no there's no roof below him that he's, you know, hang. He's really hanging from a building. Very well done. And the force perspective is fantastic. They still use force perspective. I use it. It's great. It's such a great way to do effect shots. You know, everybody uses it. And, uh, you know, it's just fantastic. Virgil Finlay, we are getting there. We're getting there, Apex. Oh, yeah, we're going to we're going to dive into some, <laughs> some <laughs> quasi mofo. <laughs> Virgil Finlay. Yeah, we're getting into some Finlay. Hollywood is currently Holly woke. Yeah, it's a sad thing, man. Back in the day, back in the 1920s, it would have been, I I couldn't even imagine the, the greatness, you know, of, Holly, of Hollywood in the 20s. There's a movie with James Garner. And he played, I, God. Yeah, I want to say he plays... Wyatt Earp, and he comes into Hollywood, and uh, uh, Bruce Willis plays Tom Mix, I believe. It's called Sunset, I think. It's great. It's the 1920s, man, and it's filmmaking in the 1920s. I love those films, much like Shadow of the Vampire uh, with Willem Dafoe. Uh, and it's it really is largely about like behind the scenes filmmaking. Of course, they, they concentrate on uh, Max Shrek, who played Nosferatu in the film, and the weirdness of Max Shrek, which Willem Dafoe is just fantastic. But it also gets into the behind the scenes. John Malkovich is behind the camera. Man, he's got the he's got the glasses on because they are just blasting light there, you know, to get an image. It's really amazing. Uh, I love those, like Hollywood behind the scenes. It's just so great. Holly Weird now, yeah. You know, it may have been Holly Weird back then, but at least it was an American Holly Weird where they weren't like, you know, uh, just denouncing every freaking thing that about Americana and America and the United States. Uh, you know, it just, it's pathetic today really is michael taylor oh yeah right T ten commandments heart yeah had to be number one no, no doubt you know cecil bill b demille at the time i I, just, I don't know if he was really beatable guys i don't think he was really nobody was really coming that close to him he was really on top uh lorenzo says lon cheney was the greatest but what's the use of having a thousand faces if none of them are lizard faces yeah he never did a reptile face you're absolutely right you know uh now that you bring that up i do not rec uh, recall a lizard type creature that he created i wonder what the who did the first lizard face that that's an interesting uh 
thing to ponder, like, you know, like a lizard or, you know, reptilian type of makeup effect. Huh. I don't know. Meyer says the hunchback would be an Eddie Murphy uh, vehicle. Eddie plays all the speaking parts like Nutty Professor. <laughs> we'll see the Cheney Murphy parallel. Fireball, Fireball Comics says, the computer has made the talentless appear talented. Yeah, yeah, God. I, I don't know, man. I, I know that there are people that are really great artists that have now taken to the computer and they draw on the computer. And they're great. They, they were excellent artists before. And now they're just doing their stuff on computer and stuff. That's, they're going to do that. And, more, you know, uh, God bless them. It's just that I look at it and I'm like, yeah, that's just all done on a computer. I just, I don't know. There's something it's, I don't know. Growing up, you know, reading comics in the 70s and 80s, uh, you just learned you love that you that's what you look at and you're like yeah man you know <laughs> and then when the computer shit hits you uh, just can't connect i cannot connect to it that's that's the problem apex i agree about heavy metal in current times mike it seems like they're lazy and don't care yeah, i think they're just kind of they're kind of milking it i mean as a matter of fact i gotta say like uh, just a quick thing because we're we got to get back to the weird tales but heavy metal just kind of like in the nineties, they just started publishing covers that were just a bunch of pinup type models, you know, scantily clad. And that's all he did. I, I, I'm going to do a show about this, about the, what happened, the change that happened. Kevin Eastman got in there and that was pretty much it. It was just all pinups and kind of crappy stuff i i just never got into it i you know as i say the the great years of heavy metals 1977 to maybe 1984 that was like really the the high point paulo costa look into the work of spanish comic artist vincente segreas work to see how he makes computer artwork look like genuine oil paintings yeah you know i mean that's people do they they and they can they can fool you they can there's no doubt about that paulo i agree because you could you know you're going to see some stuff and you're like oh that looks like an oil painting or that looks like a you know it's acrylic or whatever sagreus in his 80s working on a computer is easier <laughs> than actual painting yeah and some of these people did it you know mobius well jean Giraud, uh, gerard however really pronounce his last name mobius he was still working on computers towards the end you know he was doing the stuff you can see it you know and uh there is a i think there's a there's a logic to what you're saying there uh when people get older and it just physical you know uh abilities kind of lessen and the hands get arthritic and stuff and I un totally understand that. I totally understand that. I'm not knocking uh, any of these these guys for in, in that respect for doing that. Hello, Gratu. How are you doing, sir? Michael Taylor says that scene where Lloyd is driving Babe Ruth to Yankee Stadium like a maniac, and Ruth looks like he wants to vomit. Oh my God, I. You know, there's a, there's a, God, what film was that, Michael Taylor? Could you uh, drop the, the name of that? Uh, shit. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, it's just not coming to me. It's not coming to me, damn it. Gratu Orloff. Ward Cleaver to, told June that he had a subscription to Weird Tales when he was young. <laughs> That's so great. Uh, there we go. There we go. Ward, you know, that's it right there. Ward Cleaver, the man. Of course, you know, I, as a matter of fact, you got to wonder how many references were actually made to weird tales and maybe like amazing and a few other pulps like in, in uh, subsequent 
uh, comedy shows and films for that matter because there were there were some people you would see like some guy just casually reading an issue of weird tales in a scene in a movie i've seen it i know it and other magazines famous monsters of course and eerie and creepy and oh, just a variety of stuff even some uh, ec comics and other you know pre-code comics but weird tales i know it i've seen it at least once like some guy reading a weird tales issue I'm going to have to look that up in a movie. Lorenzo, Lon Chaney couldn't play a reptile due to a reptile dysfunction. <laughs> Michael Taylor says, the creature from the Black Lagoon was on me TV yesterday. That's fantastic, man. Matter of fact, I, it was on Tubi. They had the creature from the Black Lagoon and revenge of the creature on there for a while the creature might be the first reptil blah, 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 reptilian makeup yeah although he was amphibian but i i, I understand yeah the rep, reptile amphibian you may be correct i don't recall any other actual you know makeup prosthetic job that would that had been done before creature from the black lagoon there was the alligator man <laughs> i mean <laughs> i don't i don't mean to compare that at all with the creature from the black lagoon but it, there was the alligator man in the 50s as you may recall it, <laughs> yeah that's a classic <sighs> maybe for all the wrong reasons Apex says, Ward Cleaver is a man's man. Yes, indeed. Paulo says, now we know why Wally and Beaver <laughs> turned out way. Yes. Michael Taylor says, I know the name of that movie, but it escapes me. Now. Okay. Creature from the Black Lagoon was reptile adjacent. It was. Indeed, it was. And there was the alligator man, as I was saying. And there was, in the 60s, there was, what was the Hammer film? It was called The Reptile, right? The Hammer film? Yeah, The Reptile. And that, he, that looked pretty good. That makeup was pretty good. Uh, the Alligator Man. <laughs> oh, yes, it was The Alligator Man. Uh, so in any case, without further ado, folks, because I know we're, we've just gone into a, a whole massive amount of tangents here. Let me uh, let me get to some uh, some juicy stuff, shall we? Shall we? All right, here we go. This is just a quick thing. Just want to I want to show this. It's a quick little statement uh, about Weird Tales that's on Wikisource. Okay, Weird Tales is an American fantasy and horror fiction pulp magazine. First published in March of 1923, the magazine was set up in Chicago by J.C. Henenberger, an ex-journalist with a taste for the macabre. Now, that's the kind of guy, Henenberger, you want uh, making a pulp magazine called Weird Tales, okay? This is the thing. He was into it. And that is a key. Edwin Baird was the first editor of the monthly, assisted by Farnsworth Wright. And what happened is that Baird did not work out. They were having financial problems after the first several issues. So they kicked Baird out and Farnsworth Wright became the editor. And he was the editor for years. And he was the guy. He was the, he was the man that steered weird tales in, in the right direction editorially. But Hannenberger and Farnsworth Wright, in my opinion, they are t the two great names as far as, you know, making weird tales work, you know, making it uh, happen and uh, getting those writers and so forth. And, of course, the, and drawing from the classic writers uh, to reprint in the magazine uh, in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, so. Th those are those are two key names here, folks. J.C. Hannenberger, uh, Mr. Macabre, as I like to call him, <laughs> and Farnsworth Wright. So that was just a little bit of a thing there. And now we're going to 
take a, another look. The, there's a couple of, of websites you guys should uh, check out if you're if you're interested in uh, more weird tales goodness. But this is one here. It's quite quite good. It's pulpmags.org. I've got this blown up. I'm gonna have to bring it on down. That's pretty good. Okay. So this is really cool. Um, th it, this is just kind of an overview uh, from standard magazines to pulp to big slicks. You know, so they, so they do a bit of an overview here, which is totally cool. Uh, that you've got, you know, you've got pulp magazines in the 1910s and, of course, all throughout the 1920s and 30s and 40s. And uh, the, it just so happens that Weird Tales was the first one that was all genre as far as uh, horror, fantasy, and science fiction. They were the first. They were the ones that did it. You had, of course, in the 1910s, you had uh, crime pulps, Western pulps, and all manner of, you know, uh, pulp magazines. You know, just drama melodrama stuff and all that stuff uh <laughs> but uh yeah weird tales was in my opinion as far as those genres go it was the first and i still think it was the best argosy was huge for many decades you know cavalier was another big one but i wanted to get to something in here these are pretty cool covers you know, adventure magazine, short stories. God, you know, there was no shortage, of course. Well, it was a war thing, of course, World War One. The pulp paper was being used. Street and Smith was gigantic, of course, uh, at this time. And they had huge uh, with the detective crime and Westerns uh, just all over the place. Let's see here. What was what was the thing about this that I wanted to show you? Yeah, this is this is just a little bit here. Uh, they they get into the pulp paper magazines, nineteen fifteen to nineteen twenty. Uh, the successful conversion by Street and Smith of the tip top weekly and top notch magazine in nineteen ten led in nineteen fifteen to their conversion of the Nick Carter Weekly to Detective Story Magazine, and in 1919 to that of Buffalo Bill Weekly to Western Story Magazine. So there you go. You can see these, you know, the the pulp solidifying Street and Smith is certainly uh, got one of the leaders at that time. There, there's no doubt about that. They're just doing it. And of course, they famously published one of my favorites, one of my favorite personal pulp heroes, The Shadow. You know, for years, I love the shadow, even reading those stories, just fantastic stuff. Um, but uh, let's get to uh, Weird Tales, shall we? Now, this I'm not going to uh, this is a very short summary. It's very interesting, but I think it's worth reading. Uh, so just stick with me here. Once again, this is pulpmags.org if you're interested. On the right, you see the very first issue of Weird Tales magazine, March of 1923. And uh, But we'll get to that. Uh, let me read this real quick. Weird Tales debuted in March of 1923, providing a venue for fiction, poetry, and nonfiction on topics ranging from ghost stories to alien invasions to the occult. Okay, that's kind of... I, you know, it's kind of a weird way of putting it, but okay. J.C. Hennenberger and J.M. Lansinger, founders of Rural Publications, broke into the pulps with Weird Tales and Real Detective magazine. Edwin Baird was the initial editor, but he was, of course, as I said, replaced by uh, Farnsworth Wright uh, almost immediately. It was like a year later. He, you know, they kicked Baird out. And uh, Wright came in, thank God, and he steered the magazine in the right direction and prevented it from folding, you know, prevented an early death. Uh, he knew what he was doing. 
as far as ed editorially. So in November of 1924, the first issue uh, of Weird Tales was published by Hennenberger's new imprint, Popular Fixing, uh, Fiction Publishing, and edited by Farnsworth Wright. With this issue, Weird Tales entered its most important era. Wright continued to publish work by H.P. Lovecraft, who sold his first professional story to Baird, and that was Dagon, published in October of 1923. So that was, that was it. That kicked off the great H.P. Lovecraft professional journey with the publication of Dagon, 1923, October. You know, there's something about October and Lovecraft, much like October and Edgar Allan Poe, that totally goes together. Um, who sold his first professional story to Barrett and acquired debut stories by Robert E. Howard, Robert Block, Frank Belknap Long, among others. Weird Tales also reprinted the works of an eclectic mix of early writers, including Edgar Allan Poe, Marion Percy Shelley, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Bram Stoker. Charles Dickens, Oscar Wilde, H.G. Wells, John Keats, William Blake, Samuel Coleridge, Paul Verlaine, and Charles Baudelaire. Another selling point of the magazine was its artwork. And we're going to get to that in a second, folks. Uh, Margaret Brundage, we're going to get to her. Cover illustrations deserve a share of the credit for Weird Tales popularity. And that is true. She she does deserve a, a, a and I think <laughs> I think such illustrators as Virgil Finlay, uh, Lee Brown Coy, and Hans Bach on the inside deserve a a bit of credit too. You know they they definitely uh, had a huge impact on the magazine and on fantasy and horror art in general. You know. Um, Weird Tales never had a large circulation and often struggled to make a profit. In the, in the late 1930s, Weird Tales faced additional challenges. Robert E. Howard, whose tales of Conan call Solomon Kane, uh, which is great, I always love Solomon Kane, and Bron Moore were a major selling point for subscribers. He killed himself in 1936. Lovecraft died a year later. Howard's death was a, a bigger blow to the magazine as Lovecraft had left behind such a stock of manuscripts that Weird Tales just kept publishing posthumously all of the stuff that uh, he left behind, you know, for se at least several years after that. You know, so that's why I say, like, my favorite period of time is 1923 into the 40s because they were still, even though sadly Lovecraft was gone. They were still publishing new stuff because he had left all the stuff behind. Uh, later in 1938, Hennenberger sold the magazine to William Delaney, publisher of short stories. Delaney moved the magazine to New York, imposed new physical restraints. He began publishing the magazine through the Weird Tales Inc. imprint and uh, blah, blah, blah. All right. Let's see, between 1938 and 1940, Weird Tales underwent a series of format changing changes, expanding from 144 to 160 pages, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but here, it's just there are a few interesting things. In the 1940s and 1950s, they published stories, of course, by the great Fritz Leiber, Ray Bradbury, Theodore Sturgeon, Robert Block. They were still, you know, publishing a lot of great stuff by excellent writers or writers that, you know, maybe they were fledgling writers like young, young writers at the time, obviously all these guys were, but were already showing, you know, signs of genius, really, you know, I mean, geez, man, talk about an impressive list. Um, and uh, so that's kind of where we're going to stop it, it. They, they talk about it's, it, 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 it resurfaces again <laughs> briefly in, in the 1970s, then in the 1980s. And then there's the more successful revival, I would agree, in 1988. Uh, and uh, But it's still, you know, it lasted X amount of years. And uh, that was it. And now there's some schmo running the scene doing, you know, doing another 
thing. I'm, I don't think it's going to last. It's just so lame, sadly. But we have the original, folks. We have the original. That's what I'm talking about right now. And that's what really matters. Uh, so we've got that. We go to, I don't know what, oh, shit. Oops, I almost fucked that up. What is this? Uh, yeah, now these are just covers. I'm actually there's a better uh, thing for this. I want to go to. I want to go to. I want to show you photos right now of the people. You know, let's 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 get to the people here. So, this is our guy. This is Hannenberger in his college days. The founder, Mister Macab himself. There is the portrait of of a macab maniac, uh, the guy that really he founded uh, Weird Tales. And uh, but apparently, from what I understand, this is him in his college days. So there you go with that. But Hannenberger, one of the well, the most important name. Second, there is. Uh, uh, Farnsworth Wright, the editor, the guy that would really, you know, come in as the great editor in chief of Weird Tales in 1924. Let's see, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's Farnsworth. Uh, yeah. Now, this is the, as I showed you before, this is the uh, first issue, March 1923. Uh, Anthony Rudd's story, Ooze. <laughs> is is the cover it's the cover story but uh so th there we have issue number one the first and here's a another 1923 may of 1923 uh cover and uh for the moon terror you know some of the or let, let let's put it this way folks weird tales was trying to figure out the covers for a little while you know i mean they were uh i don't i'm not gonna i'm not really gonna bat some of them were just downright mediocre that, that's all i'm gonna say uh some of them were good uh workable but it wasn't until really in my uh, in my opinion and the opinion of others in the late 20s, that's when they started kicking in with the good artists. And, uh, you know, people like Margaret Brundage uh, came in and started doing the covers, which you will see. Uh, you know, Virgil Finlay, all these people started coming in. And uh, then you started getting better art with the Weird Tales. You know, that, that's it. I'm not going to not going to sit here and knock any of these artists. But uh, that's kind of what was going on with that. There's our guy. There's Mr. Weird Tales. <laughs> no, it's it's Lovecraft. It's Howard Howard Phillips Lovecraft, folks. Yeah. I always love this photo. It's just so beautifully menacing. You know, he just uh, just just perfect, perfect in every detail. So there's there is Lovecraft. Here comes Robert E. Howard. Now talk about Mr. Dapper right there. He is just looking. <laughs> He's great, man. You know, there's there is no doubt. In the heyday, he's that's it, you know, that's this is him. He's writing for weird tales. He's he's writing the great Conan and Solomon Kane and all all of the, the stuff that would make him really immortal, you know. Uh throughout the, the many, many decades afterwards. Yeah. So that's that's Robert E. Howard. Here's another one. One of my fa personal favorites, Hugh B. Cave. You know? Uh, just, he was all over Weird Tales, and he wrote for other pulps as well. He continued throughout. The guy was writing for decades and decades. He wrote also for Strange Tales, Pulp Magazine, which... Uh, I think only lasted like seven issues and it was also a pulp. It wasn't because it was bad. There was some screwy, 
there was something that the something with mismanagement something happened and the, the they just folded the magazine but he also wrote great stories for for uh strange tales you know so he's one of he's one of my faves in the weird tales uh his in the history of weird tales and uh, here we go there's Margaret Brundage. I could, this was like one of the better photos. Some of the photos, you know, of these people, you just, you gotta, you gotta uh, take what you can get, you know? And so that's what I'm doing. But Margaret Brundage was absolutely one of the pivotal artists for Weird Tales. We're about to take a look at her, some of her covers here. Yeah, here we go. This is one of the absolutely one of the most famous uh, Batwoman. <laughs> I don't know what you want to call what you want to call this cover, but it's just freaking awesome. Uh, and that is Margaret Brundage right there. Uh, just her art is beautiful. She did so many great, great covers. Here's another one. I mean, it's, uh, I can't blow it up, but as you can see, it, she, she didn't waste any time getting really saucy and spicy with these covers. That is just fantastic right there. You know, uh, God, you know, it, it's just, just beautiful stuff by Brundage. Let's see. That was that one. Same one, yeah. All right, yeah. There's another great one, Brundage, right here. Love that. I just love that cover. Uh, the people, yeah, of course, the cover story, The People of the Black Circle by Robert E. Howard, a smashing weird novel about eerie black magic. There you go. I love it. Okay, so I'm going to get back to the, I know you guys have had a few comments, so. Let's see here. Lorenzo says, Hammer. Uh, oh, Hammer made some of the best horror movies. Yeah, they made some great horror movies. Michael Dodd, Alligator People, 1959. Beverly Garland. Thank you, sir. Michael Taylor, Mike, name of that movie is Speedy. Thank you, Michael Taylor. I'm going to have to look it up now. That sounds like a hilarious scene when he's driving Babe Ruth around. Meyer Greenblatt, I have the same Weird Tales hardcover as you. I got it overseas while in the Army. After I finished it, my friends read it. It's always cool when regular people enjoy our stuff. The Weird Tales hardcover. Ah. Did I show you? Oh, this one? Oh, sorry. Shit. Is that the one you're talking about? Is that? I don't know. I've got a few of them. I'm about to get to. I'm about to get some to some of my stuff. But uh, Apex says, uh, "Ground the groundhog saw the shadow." Michael Taylor, Apex. I guess no early spring then. But I like to hold my magazine. Yeah, that's there's a there's something right there. Yeah. Oh, I like to fold my mag, but I like to fold my magazine. Sacrilege. Uh, Francisco says the shadow is one of my favorites. Also, that DC comic by Mike Kaluta. Yeah, Kaluta. The, those those shadow comics with Kaluta doing the covers and so forth were really good. You know, God, man. There were several artists that picked up, you know, the mantle. Uh, granted, some of those pulp covers, the art is insanely fantastic uh, for The Shadow. But uh, you had people like Kaluta. Dave Stevens did some stunning Shadow uh, artwork, you know. He was another one of those guys. There were several, of course, Jim Steranko 
Oh my God. Steranko just knocked it out of the park. Uh, Lorenzo says Mad Magazine had a page in the back. Ah, uh, that was designed to be folded. Sorry, guys. Excuse me. God. Paulo says, considering the most remembered pulp stories are, with exceptions, the one starring trademarkable characters, I'm surprised most writers didn't work that way. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, a, that's a bloody good question. Hard to beat the original. Yeah. Dark Agnes was another Robert E. Howard creation. Yeah, I mean, he, Howard did some fantastic stuff, you know, and it 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 just proves, it, it kind of shows his longevity and the way that people love him uh, to this day, you know, the, the amount of adaptations of Robert E. Howard and making some, of, arguably, some of the biggest films related to, two weird tales such as the conan films huge box office successes the the schwarzenegger films and they made a ton of other ones too you know they also did a solomon kane which wasn't bad the only thing i didn't like was the cg cgi in that you know i should have gone practical margaret brundage great artist yes i'm in total agreement um, Michael Dodd, watch some of the thriller episodes for good weird tale story adaptations. When thriller did horror, they really kicked ass. That is fantastic. I'm gonna have to go back to that, Michael Dodd. That is great, Michael Taylor. Yeah, that's cool. She's wearing a bat for a mask. Yes, I love that. You know, just it's so that is like the iconic one of the iconic weird tales covers. Francisco says. Howard Chaikin also, yes, Chaikin also with the shadow. Okay, guys. So we've seen some Brundage. Now we're going to get to a bit of uh, Virgil Finlay. Oh, yeah. Now there's Virgil Finlay. Now look at that guy, man. <laughs> Looks like he just uh, got finished unloading a truck worth of, full of, you know, I don't know, sea pods. Uh, or something, I, you know, but you know what I'm saying? Uh, and the guy, and that's Virgil Finlay, right? One of the greatest artists, I don't know. To, he's just one of the greatest artists. Uh, that, that's all there is to it. And I'm going to show you why. That's, yeah, uh, fart. God. All right. Here we go. First, this is Virgil Finlay. His pen, his pen and ink stuff is unparalleled. Here's his uh, one of his renderings of H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. So he put H.P. Lovecraft in the classic with the wig, you know, 19th century, the whole shebang. Uh, and <laughs> it's really, it's it's not. It's a really great tribute to Lovecraft. Here we go. This one is just unfreaking believable. Uh, Virgil Finlay, once again, pen and ink. I'm going to bring it up and we're going to start from the top. It's just all pen and ink, folks. This is all done on paper. There's no special effects, nothing. It's just Virgil Finlay and his freaking quill and brush. And it's the, it's just such a great piece of work because not only is it insanely good but it's funny as hell this is like this cat this tiger is just knocked out by this beautiful woman and it's flawless it's you, you if you want to talk about meticulous flawless work that doesn't seem stiff but it's perfect it's virgil finlay there is just i've never you, 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 give me show me somebody that's doing this today like this. Yeah, you, you, you're not gonna find them. Doesn't exist. Uh so uh yeah, that's that's another great one from Finlay. I think that I just get yeah. here's God, this is beautiful too. His I it's just I, I, I still can't it was 
certain things with Finlay and, you know, and I know Apex is an artist and maybe some of you other guys have thought about this, but like how he did some certain techniques, you know, I still wonder about, uh, because he is working with black space and white space simultaneously in a piece and i just i'm just like okay how is he doing that how does that actually work you know because it's not as easy as you think folks you know <laughs> you know it's not like you it's it's a uh, to get what the effect the desired effect what you're either going to do is you're going to go you got a piece of white paper you put it all black and you make it look like this or you have a piece of black paper and this is i used to do this to you you get this black paper you could scratch scratch it out and you could make your drawings you know from the like a negative space right with the white and but finlay was doing this all the time both with his drawings and it's just it's an amazing uh technique you know i mean it's not he may he probably wasn't the originator but he was just stunning in his uh his rendering of this style it's another one i love not only more horror oriented uh, uh, simpler this is just, you know, he's definitely just going with great line work here. Pen and ink. Uh, not so fancy smancy, but it's fantastic. Yeah, I just love this piece of work. Just beautiful. Just beautiful. Let me get to the chat here because I'm sure we got some. We have some uh, comments at this point. Howard shaking. Oh, shit. What happened? Apex says, Finlay looked like he would be Ernest Hemingway's brother. Yeah, I know. It's great. He just looked like an... He, he, I don't know. How do you say it? He looked like an average Joe dock worker or something. And this guy is making this insanely brilliant work. You know? Uh, I, you know? I, I don't know. I, it's hard to say. Michael Taylor, yeah, that tiger didn't get his meat yet. Virgil Finlay, whoa. Superior pen and ink artist. Very un underrated illustrator. Yeah. yeah I just can I put him in the top. You know, way in the top to this day. I, I, you know, I still marvel at how he did certain things. You know, uh, just just a stunning artist. So there we have Finlay. Uh, there's a couple of other things here. I believe I just, maybe that was the last one I did. Ah, now here's a cover that Finlay did for Weird Tales. And he did painted covers, folks. He did stuff in color, you know, and he, he was quite good with it. You know, I, I think his pen and ink is where, where he's really famous, but he, he was quite good. Uh, you know, doing the painted covers. I really, I really dug those. And he did several fantastic covers for not only for weird tales, but for fantastic mysteries. I think that was another pulp. I've got that on the, on the shelves there. But uh, for, I don't know, a variety of pulp magazines. He was, he was quite the busy illustrator because he was really quite good you know that was that was really the the reason for it let's see what's this no oh, okay we saw that okay now i just want to there's a couple, couple of other artists i just wanted to point out now matt fox did not come into uh, weird tales, I believe, until early 40s. But uh, I love his art. This guy is just, uh, he had this way of doing a primitive style. As you can see here, it has this, it's amazing. It's great. 
uh, but it's it's a primitive look, you know? It's so cool looking. Like it could have been done a hundred years before Weird Tales or something. And the thing about Matt Matt Fox is that he ended up doing, I don't know, uh a half dozen, maybe a dozen covers for Weird Tales, but he also in the 50s, the early 50s in the pre-code era, he did covers for pre-code horror comics, uh, in particular for youthful comics, chilling tales, for example. Matt Fox was all over that. You know, so he's another artist I really love. And here's another one, Hans Bach. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this up. Hans Bach, did, I'm going to show you one of the ones. I've got one Hans Bach. But Hans Bach was just exceptional in the, uh, you know, doing the, the painted covers for Weird Tales and for others, you know. Once again, all of these guys, you know, the best artists, they were all over the place. And uh, so I just wanted to, to, to show you some of that stuff because I thought you would totally dig it. Now I want to show you a couple of things real quick that you'll want to, if you're interested, you'll want to, you'll want to definitely uh, book. I'm going to put this in the, in the chat here. Oops. This is pulpmagazines.org. And uh, the great thing about pulpmagazines.org is that uh, they have a ton of pulp magazines that you can read online. It's really great. I mean, just everything, action stories. They've got the EC, Adult T Tales of Terror. And so you just click on it, and then you can read an issue uh, in PDF format. <laughs> I mean, this is great. Air Wonder Stories. All story detective. Amazing. There's amazing. Right there. 1926. Oh, yes. Uh, A. Merritt's fantasy. You know. And, of course, weird tales. That, that's why I'm. That's really what I'm getting to here, folks. And here's the weird tales. On pulpmagazines.org. Oh, yes. So they start with the first issue, March 1923. It's not every issue, like for instance, it's March, April, May, June, but then it goes to September of 23, November of 23, and then to January of 1924. It keeps going. As you can see, it's going all the way through the 30s into the 40s. to up to, well geez up to january of 1954 right there you know so there man you got dozens and dozens of issues of weird tales there's that great october 1983 margaret brundage cover she was doing so so many there's black colossus uh robert e howard right there i also love this form I, I like the look of this too their header on this they changed it of course but here you go uh, you've got robert e howard clark ashton smith paul ernst alexander dumas dumas or dumas uh in an issue of weird tales 1931 some really cool covers uh there's no doubt about it i it, as i say the later you go when you get into the late 20s they get start getting some interesting covers that are truly weird and bizarre. You know, like this one, the Star Stealers, Edmund Hamilton, weird science fiction. You know, they were doing it. <laughs> the Devil Plant. That is just nice. So in any case, you can see that uh, there are a a ton. There's a literal ton here, folks, of uh, weird tales. All you do is you click on it, and it takes you right to the PDF. It's great.
absolutely fantastic. Really well done. God, it must have taken a freaking years to... to man, this guy has got so many scanned pulps. It's hard to freaking believe, you know? Uh, just incredible resource. So that's pulpmagazines.org. Highly recommended if you want to check out uh, and read some pulps online. Also, let me just get back to the uh, the other magazine. I, I absolutely recommend uh, pulpmags.org. I'm going to put that into the chat too because I think that's absolutely those. I mean, there's there are other websites folks that this is these are two pulpmagazines.org and pulpmags.org that i really love uh because you, you you could just spend well you could literally spend years uh on it if you wanted to read all the pulps uh on that on that website guy it's hard to believe the amount of work that's monumental work that goes into i mean if any of you have ever scanned a magazine, you know what's going on. And this is scanning pulp magazines. But I don't even, I'm not quite sure how, I mean, just to get a hold of those things. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. And I'm not going to speculate either. But uh, you have to have, to do good scans, you got to have some good issues. I'm telling you that. Right there, man. So, in any case. That is uh, online. That's what I wanted to show you about uh, Weird Tales. And now let me show you some of the stuff that I've got. Now, for the most part, uh, there, I have reprints <laughs> because there's no way I can afford the originals. But I do have some originals now. Uh, and I love them. I'm going to take them out. I mean, they're, look, they're, once again, I bought these. They're somewhat beat up a little bit. I mean, they're still in pretty good shape. Now, this is March, right? Yeah. This is Weird Tales from March of 1934. And it is one of my favorite. It's, it's a Margaret Brundage cover. And uh, there's several great things. Not only is this, issue just all the way through fantastic uh fiction and you can find it you can watch you can read it now on that on the website that i just put in the chat uh the stories are fantastic i'm just gonna bring it in a bit there the black gargoyle by hugh b cave is just uh it's 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 great it is a great story not only that but you have edmund hamilton in this clark ashton smith paul ernst and you can see down there, let's see, God, I keep getting, yeah, right there, Hazel Held. Hazel Held, a.k.a. H.P. Lovecraft. Hazel Held was a writer. She wrote, you know, a variety of stories. But for Weird Tales, what happened is that uh, she submitted the stories to Lovecraft and Lovecraft would just be like, hey, this is an interesting premise. It just needs to, a, a total rewrite. So he would take her premise, you know, her outline, and actually write the story. And some of those stories are fantastic. I mean, The Winged Death, which is the Hazel Held story in here, a.k.a., you know, Lovecraft story. And this one is fantastic. I love The Winged Death. Um, the stories in this are, I mean, you got the charnel God, uh, Clark, Clark Ashton Smith. And, you know, this, it actually, this is held up pretty well. You know, the pages, they're not, uh, nothing's, yeah, there it is. There's the wing death. There's, there's the illustration too. Fantastic. Uh, love the story. There are so many, God, there's some creepy freaking stories in this issue. 
highly recommended March of 1934, folks. If you want to read it, it's online. Just go to that the the link. Uh, but uh, in any case, the this is my my the favorite w weird tales that I own, and, and it's the only 1930s issue that I have because yeah, they're bloody expensive. They are bloody expensive. Needless to say, okay. This one's a little later, but uh, Lovecraft's still kicking it, and that's what why I bought this. Brought this uh, the or bought this issue, this uh, for, 1940s issue of Weird Tales with the fantastic Hans Bach cover. Just weird. <laughs> like you know, every time I see a cover like this, I'm like, yeah, that's a weird fucking what? What the hell's going on with this cover? And then I'm like, oh, yeah, it's weird tales. It makes total sense, yes. Um, but in any case, it says, A New Lovecraft Series, Herbert West Reanimator. Right there. So there you go. Posthumously, Lovecraft is still kicking it, man, even though he died in 1937. And uh, this is a good... This, is, this one's in much better shape. They have... Odd little things like superstitions and taboos and things like that, um, which you would see later, like in pre-code comics. Remember that, guys? I don't know if you've seen like issues where they would suddenly there would be like one or two pages like superstitions of the Orient or something. And they'd have like a page of illustrated superstitions and all that. But uh, in any case, this is another one that I love. And I, you know, I got it for the Lovecraft. I, I, I must admit, I got it for uh, the Lovecraft and the Hansbach cover. Although the Gray La Spina story, The Rat Master, is not bad either. So there you go. And the only other original... <laughs> Weird tales that I have from back in the day is uh, uh, this one's this one's pretty kind of screwed up. This this is actually March of 1950, 1953. Yeah, March of 1953, and. Uh, I bought it because I uh, I wanted to read the story Slime, and it's really good, actually. But uh, it also has a really cool Virgil Finlay cover, painted cover. So this Finlay is just rocking it. The guy is just like kicking butt from the late 20s into the 1950s for Weird Tales magazine with both painted covers and, of course, his incredible pen and ink work, you know. So. Those are my three. And this is, as you can see, it's like taped spine. It's all just, you know, this was, I, I don't know, I paid like $10 for it. You know, the other ones were a little costlier, but they still weren't that that bad because they're kind of on the low grade side. But uh, I still love them. I love them. I love them, I tell you. But uh, so let me get to a couple of, recommendations here this is linked in the description and uh, if you want to read about the weird tales uh story well what better book than the weird tale story by robert weinberg this book is freaking fantastic it has been reprinted many times with good reason because it is a great book on the subject Matter of fact, there's a couple of things I just want to point out here. I have them bookmarked. Oh, yes, I do. There we go. All right. In the first place. Now, there's there's our guy right there. I mean, it kind of leads off with a great photo of Farnsworth Wright, the editor. The, the editor, definitely. Yeah, it gives, what, where the hell is the index? Oh, weird. Maybe it's in the back. 
these freaks. I don't know, but in any case, it has a brief history. It goes kind of methodically. They talk about the writers and the artists and stuff. But here's the thing about Houdini. I just want to read this real quick. It's it's not very long. <clears throat> okay, they're talking about um, uh, yeah. This is 1924. This was a 1920. Yeah. Okay. May. Yeah. 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 They did this thing. Uh, rural rural per, uh, publications, of course, uh, had published this special anniversary issue dated May, June, July of 1924. Um, and uh, so what happened is that uh, the issue featured several, as they, they go along, several fine stories. Lovecraft was present with two pieces of fiction in this special anniversary issue. One was the cover story, Imprisoned with the Pharaohs, ghost written for Houdini. Okay, so it's got Houdini's name on it. It was written by Lovecraft. Um, and uh, and he, the, as they say it, uh, it's about Houdini's adventures in, in Egypt. However, the story behind the story was extremely interesting, as stated by uh, founder J.C. Hennenberger. And it went like this. Not long, not long after I had inaugurated Weird Tales, I had a call by Houdini at my Chicago office. He expressed more than usual enthusiasm for the magazine, and the meeting resulted in a friendship that lasted until his untimely death a few years later. He often regaled me with experiences of, of his that rivaled anything I had ever read in books. Several of these I published, but they were written in such a prosaic style that they evoked little comment. However, one day he unfolded one astounding story of a trip to Egypt that I knew only a Lovecraft could do justice to. Lovecraft did a masterful job on the outline and details I sent him, but asked not to have his name associated with the publication of the story. So it was the total ghostwriter. It was published by Houdini, you know, as they did. But adding to the above story was the fact that Lovecraft wrote the story shortly before his marriage to Sonia Green. In best slapstick fashion, HPL managed to lose the manuscript and to, uh, to okay, HPL managed to lose the manuscript. And to meet his deadline, the story was rewritten on his wedding night with Sonia doing the typing. So there you go. That's classic Lovecraft. You could just see it now. I mean, it's, you know, he's just, there, there is a comedy aspect to Lovecraft. Uh, I don't know. Like, a, it, there's like the absent minded genius. That's kind of Lovecraft right there, you know. But so this book has got those anecdotes that are just freaking awesome they they hit on the artist of course there's a ton they get into a ton of the black and white illustrations that grace the pages throughout the years and you know of course the the black and white illustrations interior illustrations are done really well they do what they can with the covers of course this is all black and white there's no uh, color pages uh but uh they do a great job of, you know, of course, as they're as they're talking about the various writers. And we got some a couple of great photos in here, actually. Yeah, there's Gray Laspina. There we go. That's her. And naturally, they're gonna. They're going to have Lovecraft in there and Seabury Quinn down at the bottom there. So, so you've got, you know, it, it, it moves in a, a, a very good progression. This is one of the greats too. 
this is what really makes this thing stand out. Recollections of weird tales by the artists and writers themselves. So you have these people talking about their time working or writing stories or doing art for weird tales, including Frank Belknap Long, Gray Laspina, uh, Warner Munn, Edmund Hamilton, Robert E. Howard talks about uh, doing stuff for Weird Tales, Wallace West, Robert Block, Carl Jacoby. I mean, it's great. Lee Brown Coy, the, the great artist that did <laughs> such just weird, weird stuff for uh, the pages. Great, great, just a, an odd artist, man, you know? Uh, and one of the great things that I always loved what were, was the, uh, the letter section. The letter section of Weird Tales magazine was fantastic. It was almost at times better than the actual magazine itself because what, what would happen a lot of the people that wrote in were also writers or artists. Like for instance, you would see like Lovecraft would write this long letter to the editor of weird tales talking about various stories or artists, or he would go off on a tangent and then people would respond to that. So you had, not only did you have like people writing letters to the editor, but then they would write letters in response to letters that were written like by Lovecraft or uh, Robert E. Howard or whatever to the Erie section. And they called it the Erie was the uh, letters to the editor section. It's fascinating. Because what, what happens is that when you start reading these letters to the editor and they just nonchalantly mention something that's going on at, you know, in the 1920s, you know, like, yeah, well, the, you know, that bomb that went off in New York, blah, 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 you know, those anarchists are at it again, shit like that, or, you know, uh, something that happened in, you know, uh, Europe, uh, with with Mussolini or whatever and they just these are things that like you know they of course because it's the stuff that's going on at the time so it makes for an incredible historical record uh, because these people aren't trying to like tell you anything they're just writing a letter to the editor to say yeah this story was great this one sucks don't publish this guy again. I love this art. Hey, did you hear about Mussolini? <laughs> I mean, it was it was 1920s, folks. Uh, 1920s, 1930s, especially communications, right? I mean, we were communicating shit when I grew up. Uh, you know, when I was writing letters in the 70s and 80s, I was writing letters in the 70s and 80s. You know, you go, you get your stamps, you send it off, you wait, uh, you know, uh, X amount of time to get a response unless you're going to get on the phone with somebody, which I still wrote letters as opposed to having like long conversations, really, with people on the phone. I would write letters, you know. So the letters to the editor thing was huge in Weird Tales. And uh, so that pretty much, well, except for a couple of things I want to show you guys. Now, these these aren't quite as exciting. They're just reprints. And I showed this the last time. Now, this is a, a 1924 issue uh, with a story by Houdini. What By Houdini, of course, ghostwritten by Lovecraft. Uh, you know, and uh, so, and it's just a reprint, very well done reprints. As I say, you can pick these up on lulu.com or even on eBay, but watch it because eBay, I, some of these idiots try to gouge you for reprints and they try to like charge you 50 bucks for something like that. They, you can get them on Lulu for about 10 bucks and they're well done. You know, I have no complaints. Of course, it's all all black and white interiors but the reprints are good i think they do a just a, a a very 
decent job of replicating the issue so you can enjoy the ads hilarious ads that you would see uh in these these god damn like uh <laughs> oh, those were the days, folks. Those were the days. I just have to show you this. This is 1924. Okay. There's an ad. You can get just, you know, hey, kids, get your 38 special. <laughs> right there. It says, let me read it. It says, uh, hey, send no money for this fine 38 special, a real He-Man gun. Only $18.75 from American Novelty Company. Yes, folks, it's your uh, your freaking the uh, 38 what what the let me read the fine print on this. Some of these things are ridiculous, man. Got it. Very hard. Uh Uh, it's hard to even, I'm sorry. It's hard to read some of the fine print with this reproduction. But I see something like, protect yourself with a dependable weapon. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. So, so many things were like cash on delivery and shit. People just trusted people a lot more back back at the in that time. You know, it's like send no money, just we'll send it to you and then just you know pay cash on delivery. Jesus Christ, man. I just just various things like that, you know. I mean that that's the most hilarious one though. Your 38 special, the He-Man gun. I mean, come on, man. That is that is just fantastic. Oh well, in any case, so this is a replica and it's really good. I highly recommend uh as I said before, if you're interested in physical replicas, go to lulu.com. If you want to just read digitized issues go to the the uh one place the the website that i put in the chat you know uh it's fine you can just, you can jesus you have i don't know untold uh hours of enjoyment uh reading those so i just wanted to point this out like for instance this is something i had to get this issue this is this is night yeah this is march of 1930 this is a replica once again you know but what's really interesting about this particular issue let me tell you let me tell you what's in here okay you have uh, yeah okay well hp lovecraft is in this with his one of his verse a poem called the ancient track you have seabury quinn gaston Leroux, of course phantom of the opera uh has a story in this uh called in letters of fire it's just really great stuff man uh you have paul ernst the black monarch part two august derelith is in here with the pacer and uh the the uh the cherry on top folks is a little story called the thought monster now you may go the thought monster what the hell is that and then i'll say well it's a really great science fiction horror story written by amelia reynolds long and then you'll be like who the hell is amelia reynolds long well let me tell you, folks, The Thought Monster is a great short film, and it was made in, I don't know, 1959, 1958, something like that, into a film called Fiend Without a Face, one of the great science fiction 
films, in my opinion, of the 50s that did not get uh, the, I mean, it's, it, it, well, it did. It got, I mean, it did get notoriety. It just wasn't as big as some of the other 50 science fiction films. Uh, but this is a Criterion DVD of Fiend Without a Face, you know, and uh, they even reference it. It's fantastic. Comes with a little book. And uh, here's what they say The script by Herbert Leader was based on the Amelia Reynolds long story, The Thought Monster, published in 1930 in the greatest of the pulp horror magazines, Weird Tales. So these dudes were hip on the scene. They were freaking hip. They knew what was up, where to give credit where credit's due. And it's Amelia Reynolds long, this chick that wrote a story in 1930 and sold it to Weird Tales. And then... You know, 28, 29 years later, it would become Fiend Without a Face. And it's Fiend Without a Face. It's fan if you haven't seen it, see it. See the film. It's a great piece of science fiction. It really, it's really something else. So here's others that I have. These are, once again, replicas. And these are all from Lulu. Okay. This is... June of 1926. Now, I, I bought some of these because of the Lovecraft. You know, I'm loving the Lovecraft, folks, uh, obviously. And this one has got The Moon Bog, a short story by Lovecraft. But it's also got a few other things in here. Uh, Marian, F. Marion Crawford, The Upper Birth. You guys read that one? That is a classic story. Uh, this is, once again, June of 1926. It is, yeah, <clears throat> it's called Number 12, The Upper Birth by F. Marion Crawford. This is a creepy freaking story. So if you want to read it online, just remember when you go to that website that has these digitized Look for June of 1926. If you want to read a scary, creepy story, read number 12, The Upper Birth. Okay? That's all I'm saying. That's what I'm saying to you. There. It's another one from October of 1930. Hmm. Well, it's got verse from Lovecraft again. He did a, he did a lot of poetry, but it also has uh, Clark Ashton Smith and Seabury Quinn, as well as August Derleth. Now, yeah, a lot of these covers, like, okay, as you can see, in the 20s, a lot of covers were done by this artist, Hugh Rankin. And I just, you know, I'm glad that they moved more into like artists like Margaret Brundage. <laughs> I mean, it's all right. I'm not trying to slam the guy or anything, but it's just that they, they were trying to find an artistic direction and I'm glad they finally found it. Let, let me put it that way. It, it took a few years though for them to, uh, to do that. Let me show you that one. Maybe this one. Yeah, this is March 1929. It's, it's This is a pretty interesting cover. They had a lot of like classical, almost mythological looking covers, you know. Uh, I don't know, that, that type of thing. But this particular issue, <clears throat> once again, has August Darrell. It's got, uh, yeah, that's why I got this. It's got Frank Belknap Long. The Hounds of Tindalos, a tale of unutterable horror, of a pursuit by loathsome entities through the ages and through the dimensions. The Hound of Tindalos. 373, let's, let's see if they got a, an illustration. God damn. Oh, that, there we go. That, okay, well. 
Not the greatest illustration. But in any case, The Hounds of Tindalos, great. Frank Belknap Long was quite a writer. And he was he was a, a real pal, a friend of Lovecraft's. They had their little club. There was a club, like a little group of writers and so forth, and some artists in New York, you know. Uh, and uh, so he was definitely influenced. Everybody was influenced by Lovecraft. Certainly Frank Belknap Long was. But uh, other than the reprints, folks, you can also get some really I mean, these, these books don't, don't cost much you can find them on ebay you can find them online probably like thrift books will sell them this is pretty interesting weird tales 32 unearthed terrors and it says a story from each year the classic horror and fantasy magazine was published so just they just took a story from each year literally from 1923 to 1924 and uh, so you've got a ton of people Obviously, Robert E. Howard, Seabury Quinn, Clark Ashton Smith, Mary Elizabeth Councilman, Fritz Leiber, H.P. Lovecraft, Henry Kuttner, Robert Block, Frank Belknap Long, Ray Bradbury, Theodore Sturgeon, Frederick Brown, Isaac Asimov. Yes, Isaac Asimov made the pages of Weird Tales, folks. Uh, August Derelis, Richard Matheson, you know, pretty good. Pretty good, and you can also get you can find this sucker for like I don't know ten to twenty dollars, you know. So it's they're not they're simply not that expensive. I guess is what I'm getting at. These are really cool. I found I I looked and looked and I was able to find uh, a couple. Of, these are okay. Let me, let me explain something. <clears throat> these are the same book, okay. They just have different covers. It's Weird Tales uh, selected and introduced by Peter Haining. And you can find <clears throat> you can find these once again. They're not going to run you that much. One, 10 or 20 bucks, I think. But what's really cool about this. Okay, is it this one? Yeah, well, he does. The reproductions of the... Uh, <clears throat> of the original art, or, you know, the illustrations inside are really good. <clears throat> and uh, he introduces each story, so he kind of gives a little background uh, on the stories. But, what, yeah, there's something. I know that he had a something about a... Oh, my God, here we go. Yeah, that's the difference. This is literally... God, how did he do that? Okay, he reproduced. Like this, if you look at this, you'll notice something. He's reproduced literally the actual magazine into a book format. That's what he's done. So you have all the ads <laughs> like this. Once again, this one, and once again, folks, this is like uh, ten to twenty dollars. You can find it on eBay, thrift books, whatever you know. But it's got, it's just got, it's got all of the art, all of the interior illustrations. It's got the letters to the editor, the eerie section, which is the letters to the editor on this. Excellent, excellent. So if if you're looking for something in book form. This is Weird Tales, edited by Peter Haining. And uh, let me give you a date on that. 1976, and then reprinted 1990. Oh, there it is. Very good. Very good. You know, to for some weird, for some top-notch Weird Tales material is what I'm saying here, folks. All right. Whew. That's it. That's what I got. The one, the one. If you want to, if you want to get into some great uh, history, anecdotes, background, and find out what Weird Tales really was all about, the Weird Tales story by Robert Weinberg is it. This, the link is in the description. This has been reprinted many times. Uh, you know, it, 
uh, God, I think this is like going on its 14th printing. This was originally done, this was originally uh, published in 1977. Uh, Wild Side Press, by the way. Wild Side has done a lot <clears throat> in the name of pulp magazines. I showed you this, this book that I have. It's a little book. This is literally 1923, Weird Tales 1923, once again, by Wild Side Press. And uh, this simply takes uh, a few stories from each month of the magazine during 1923. And of course, for October, you have Dagon by H.P. Lovecraft reprinted in this little book, you know. And once again, they're not that expensive. Wild Side Press, man, out of New Jersey, right here. Okay, folks. Ugh. Eyes are about to bulge out of my freaking head. Uh, let me get to the. Let, let me get to the. The. Uh, uh, I think we probably may have a few a few chats here. The black gargoyle. Yeah, the black gargoyle, man. The hell did I put it? I love it too. It's just, I don't know, it's one of those covers. I've even seen people bad mouthing this cover. Uh oh. I'm about my thing's about to die. Uh, yeah. But that is a great Margaret Brundage cover for the Black Gargoyle. I think I'm about to get uh, what I'm doing. Uh, it's great timing. Just hang with me for one second my good camera is dying so uh i am going to switch folks i need to switch to the crap camera oh yeah okay where are you bloody bowls can be in there camera oh this is is it this one? No. What the hell is going on? I have no idea, folks. No, it's not giving me any, uh, it's not giving me an option for my laptop camera. Pretty weird. Hmm. I wonder why. Well, in any case, I didn't have anything else to show you. So I guess the timing's good. As long as you can hear me. Uh, I think that's the important. You can just look at my sweet mug while, while I'm here talking to you guys. Most excellent stream horror, Mike. Thank you, Apex. Thank you, sir. I'm glad you, you got some stuff out of it. You know, you, you could go, I could go, you know, there's so many artists and writers involved with Weird Tales, and I'm going to be hitting some other stuff uh, soon, okay? That's, that's what I'm saying. Other aspects. As I said, next Friday night, I'm doing a film adaptation uh, related show of, you know, uh, movies directly or indirectly revolving around Weird Tales magazine, such as Lovecraft adaptations, Edgar Allan Poe, Robert E. Howard, God, you could go on, Bram Stoker. You guys know what I'm saying. There's a lot. There is a lot that springs from the mother Weird Tales. Forget about Reed. You could stare at the art for years. Oh, you could. It's just insanely great stuff. Inspired by Creepy's Loathsome Lore. Well, Los Creepy's War. Oh, I'm sorry. By Warren's Creepy's Loathsome. What was inspired by? I, I didn't I didn't get that. Cool stuff, Mike. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Michael Taylor. Uh, the books. Oh, great for the covers alone. They are fantastic. But man, the stuff inside is is excellent. Hello, Lead Paint. How are you doing, sir? God, good to see you. 
uh, Michael Taylor. Mike, you're right. The letters are fascinating to read. Yet, Mandy, does, does some of the stuff these people say is just, uh, it's great, man. I mean, because a lot of the writers like Lovecraft. Lovecraft was also one of the biggest Weird Tales fans. So he would, I mean, he was reading everything and he would, you know, put in his two cents, man. He would send the letters to the editor and uh, the guy, the, the way that Lovecraft wrote, he could write a short story that was a letter. You know what I'm saying? He just, he could churn out three or four or 5,000 words and, hey, this is my letter to the editor. No problem. That's, of course, why there are five volumes of Lovecraft letters. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but yeah, there's five volumes that were put out, published by Arkham House. And I would say the five volumes add up to like, God, at least 1,200 pages of letters. Just letters of Lovecraft writing to other writers or wherever the hell. <clears throat> because the guy wrote some freaking letters. Let's put it that way. Uh, Lead Paint says COD was great and I used it. Up to the 1980s, just had to pay the mailman when they delivered. Yeah, you know, that was it. Goodbye to that. Could you imagine? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, it's cash. Yeah, cash on delivery, man. That was the thing. Um, Michael Taylor, look where we are today with guns. <laughs> scary. Scary. I, don't, I, I like my guns. Come on, man. There's, you know, there's a certain sexiness to guns, too. Uh, especially when you're you have them and the criminal doesn't. That's that's the good thing. Uh, Michael Dodd says in the 1993 the sci in 1993 the Sci Fi Channel ran the Mutant Meltdown, which included Fiend Without a Face and some other good monster flicks. I taped them and burned many of them to disc later. Great monster movie. Yeah, it is. I just love Fiend Without a Face. It's absolutely superb. Hello, Coopers. Well, I can't really read. Read. Oh, hello. I, I see now. You see, when you guys uh, put an emoji in there, I've got to look at the actual YouTube video because StreamYard does not. It's just it look, it's a little block. It does not translate the emojis. But hello and live long and prosper. Uh, <laughs> I think. It looks like the the Vulcan hand sign. Uh, Coopers. Francisco says, another awesome stream, Mike. Got to go. Creeps, have a good week. You too, Francisco. Thank you for coming. Uh, really appreciate it, man. And I'll, I'll see you soon. Michael Dodd, fun show. See you Friday. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Cooper says, in France, we only have a pocket edition with arbitrary selected stories. A collection supervised by Jacques Sadoul with the advice of Jacques Berger, who collected them. Oh, wow. Huh. Well, there is that, you know, as I showed you, uh, Cooper's the, uh, the online source, if you want to. I mean, that is like the pure Weird Tales magazine. I'm going to drop it in there again. But this is the place to go if you want to just read all the weird tales this is fantastic i'm putting it in the in the chat right now there we go it's pulpmagazines.org they have all of well they don't have all of the issues they have a ton many many of the weird tales the early weird tales magazines scanned and in pdf form uh for free on the website pulpmagazines.org it is really quite something. Uh, Michael Taylor, it sounded like you said crap, crappy camera. Yeah, I don't know what the hell. I, I, The other camera, you know, it shut down because the battery just died. And uh, then uh, I tried to switch to the, uh, you know, the laptop camera. It doesn't recognize it. I bet you what I have to do is shut this down then come back into StreamYard 
so it will recognize the laptop camera, but I'm not going to do that because uh, I've already shown you everything I've got, guys. Um, hello, graphic man. God. Oh, emoji is cool. Me wearing sunglasses. <laughs> this is great. Uh, hello, graphic man. There's the, the thing. You're welcome, Cooper. Uh, Michael Taylor, Mike had a blast as always. All right, folks. Well, that was it. I hope you enjoyed the show. Now, as I said, next Friday night, we're going to take a look at, this is going to be Weird Tales Part 2. This is going to be a multi-part series because we are in the 100th anniversary of Weird Tales. And there's a, there's a lot of stuff. There's a, many areas to cover in the Weird Tales uh, universe. And one of them, of course, are the film adaptations. So if, if you guys want, you know, think about that uh, for next Friday. Uh, adaptations, I mean, it's huge. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of movies, I, maybe even thousands, that are in some way linked to Weird Tales, either, you know, indirectly or directly. But uh, it's freaking huge. The, the impact that Weird Tales Pulp Magazine had on horror fantasy and science fiction is immeasurable it it i mean man uh, <laughs> i just all you got to do is think about in terms of two people robert e howard and uh hp lovecraft then think of how much impact they have today i mean holy crap it, it's it's amazing it really it is quite amazing uh you know and that's because of Weird Tales. That's because Weird Tales brought them into the fold and said, yes, you are great writers. We are going to pay you. We are publishing you. And so Weird Tales is it, folks. They were the ones. Um, so next Friday, adaptations, Weird Tales universe adaptations to film. And we've got quite a few to look at. It's going to be a hell of a show fireball comics uh, uh, another pulp archive yes indeed yeah that that was the you know that's the one i've gone to in the past i am sure there's there's probably some other ones where you can download you know issues of uh weird tales and other ones you know like amazing stories and stuff but that one just uh it's it's quite good it's quite good so uh highly recommended Thank you, folks, uh, for being here. And uh, once again, the Weird Tales story, which I highly recommend. The link is in the chat. It is. It has gone through its umpteenth. Re oh shit! I can't. <laughs> I keep trying to show it to you. The Weird Tales story by Robert Weinberg. The link is in the chat. If you want to check it out, it's an amazing book on Weird Tales. You will love the anecdotes and, of course, the information on the writers and artists, the stories and so forth. And, and of course, the publisher, you know, uh, and our great, the editor who uh, really brought it together, Farnsworth Wright, you know. But, of course, Hannenberger, the founder of Weird Tales, the lover of the macabre himself Hannenberger. in any case it's in the description folks check it out and uh have a great rest of the weekend and i will see you guys on friday take care <laughs>